let's uh, introduce yourselves. You're about, I, I guess, your profession and what uh, what insight you hope to offer in either bioactivity or bioavailability. Let's start at the end. Um, I'm just going to speak loudly if that's okay with everybody. My name is Amick Blair. I'm a PhD chemist by training. And um, for the last uh, 17, 18 years, so for the last 17, 18 years, I've basically been developing uh, different kinds of delivery systems to either protect enzymes or deliver active ingredients. And these active ingredients can span from vitamin C uh, to CBD, which is really what we'll be talking about today. Um, now, all of this is done by a company of mine that I've had for about uh, a decade now. And uh, we contract manufacture a variety of different uh, supplements, including hemp, and then also do uh, clinical studies to back up um, all of our products. And uh, we've published papers on uh, absorption of vitamin C, glutathione, uh, CBD, uh, et cetera. Uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Schmidt. I uh, have formal training as a PhD chemical engineer. And right now I'm working with Centuria Foods as the director of research and development. Um, we've been developing a lot of water soluble products uh, and technologies and um, recently we've performed a pharmacokinetic study to kind of back up some of our research. So I'll be giving you guys some insight on, on that area. My name is Jackson Rowland. Uh, I have a bachelor degree in chemistry, and I uh, work with a company called Green Genomics. We do DNA testing to help match people to the products that best suit their needs. Um, we use the information that we have to help identify the genes that relate to metabolic properties of the endocannabinoid system. So bioavailability directly relates to that. Hello, my name is Marcus Lajeda. Um Currently, I'm involved in a quality of life study with CBD, and we're um, studying retired athletes that have had traumatic brain injuries and using CBD to supplement um, in various for, uh, formulations. And we're about a little over halfway done with the study. And um, aside from that, I, my background is in biology and nanotech. And uh, I've spent some time um, encapsulating uh, various uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients uh, with liposomes, um, micelles, and uh, nano encapsules. So, that's my background. Cool. My name is Chris Nicola. I've founded and in, in the uh, CEO and chemist at Santier. We've taken a slightly different approach. We don't use liposomes or water soluble or anything, but we're able to get a higher solubility rate. Um, so we know that directly relates to better bioavailability. I'd love to see some of the data from this panel as well to see just what's going on there. But what we've also designed is our products that have certain effects. CBD we know does inflammation very well, or anti-inflammation. What we focus on exterior to that are the terpene blends that really give um, significant effects. So uh, from a solubility and bioactivity aspect, we know we have 100% solubility for the CBD. We now are, are trying to work with other groups to figure out what that actually means in a biological or, or academic setting. Thank you, panel. I want to jump off something you said just now, uh, which was uh, some sort of correlation between water solubility and was it bioactivity or was it bioavailability? Uh, uh, I guess, do any of you have any insights into that, into water solubility and how that correlates to and affects bioactivity or bioavailability? Anyone? Uh, yeah, I can chime in. Um, so we recently performed a pharmacokinetic study where we, um, we had four different products. Uh, uh, two were oil soluble, one we used isolate, another one we used um, an extract. And then we had two of our water soluble products. Um, and we found uh, with the oils, it took almost two to four hours before you have any blood plasma levels um, of CBD. And uh, in contrast, when you had these water solubles, um, because uh, we end up making micelles, which are really small particles, 
So you take the oils and you, um, you, you get tiny droplets and then you coat the surface with something called a surfactant uh, and that allows them to be dispersible in water. Um, there's a, a much higher surface area and so after 10 minutes you're already seeing blood plasma levels and then uh, 30 minutes you hit peak concentrations of CBD in your blood. Um, there's also some other uh, things that you can add into these mixtures. We have um, a formula that we're working on right now, uh, we call it Boost and it enhances the bioavailability by about 30%, so you can get uh, an extra 30% out of your product um, when you ingest these. What, maybe I'm ignorant, but what do you mean when you say increase 30% of bioactivity? What does that mean? So, so at the same time points, uh, when you pull the blood plasma, um, the concentration is, is increased by 30%. Okay, so that's percentages of cannabinoids in the blood plasma. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so passing through your, your membranes and your intestines. And that's the measure of bioavailability is concentration in yes. plasma? Yes, yeah. Okay, that I'm learning so much. <clears throat> um, moving on, uh, I guess continuing in this, uh, I guess I want to frame this discussion. It sounds like everyone up here has been researching specifically into CBD. Is anyone doing CBDA or any other cannabinoid? Yep. You are? Yeah, so uh, we finished our CBD studies, you know, similar to what he just described. Pharmacokinetics, where basically you give somebody the product, you track it in their blood, you see what the blood levels are, and then you do a crossover, and that means that you give them, let's say, a plain CBD product, right? So you're using my cells, and that, then you do a comparison, right? Um, so we did that about a year ago or so, and that'll be published, you know, in the next few weeks. Um, currently, we're working on a lot of CBG and seeing uh, what the efficacy is. We're doing a safety study. So right now, I mean, we're talking about bioavailability, but the thing about our industry right now is nobody's even taken and asked the first step. If you take CBD on a regular basis, what's going to happen to you? What's your liver going to look like? What are your kidneys going to look like? What's your heart going to look like? Right? I mean, th these are very, very important questions. So before we venture off into pharmacokinetic studies, we always do a safety study first to make sure that you know, we're not going to injure, hurt, or uh, do any harm to anybody. Is that animal studies? Pardon me? For safety, animal? No, human. No, no, we, we, we don't do any testing on animals. These are all human volunteers. Um, I'm not too concerned about toxicity. Well, we go through an uh, institutional review board, so it's a board of doctors, and we tell them, we, we suggest to them what we'd like to do, and then they come back and say, look, this is what we're comfortable with you doing. You know, there is some information out there. It's not properly gathered in a scientific fashion, um, suggesting that CBD is safe. But right now, we're in the process of really collecting, you know, is CBD safe? Is CBG safe? Um, all of these things. Um, and, and you're framing your research in terms of individual cannabinoids sounds like not ratios, or are you venturing into that? Well, I think step one is to understand what each cannabinoid does, right? So, you know, if we put a full spectrum, you know, oil plus all the terpenes in there, when you see outcomes, the question is, well, what caused that outcome, right? And we have done a study on full spectrum oil, right? Because we want to know what does the product we actually manufacture do, right? So we, we do have that outcome. But now to really understand what's doing the heavy lifting and what's there just for show? I mean, that, that's a really important question. I mean, if you look at the current state of scientific literature, it would suggest that CBD does the least amount of work, right? And it's the minor cannabinoid and the terpenes that do all the heavy lifting, right? Um, and, I mean, the other can research... You, can you go on about that research? I'm, sure. I haven't read that research. Right, right, right. So, so there's a, a few papers. That you guys, I, I don't want to take all the go time here. It. But, you know, there's a few paper, um, you know, one is the bell-shaped curve that, that talks about basically what the right dose of CBD is. And what you see is that over time, CBD doesn't work as effectively, and the doses have to go up and up. And the outcomes just aren't as good as with full spectrum. So it begs the question, is like, why is other minor amounts of cannabinoids doing more than just the CBD on its own, right? But, but that kind of makes sense, right? Hemp is a natural plant, and it's got hundreds of molecules, millions of molecules in it, different kinds. And 
stripping it down to one active ingredient is generally not a fantastic way to go forward. And we, we've had, in the herb world, we have experience where we've stripped out all the good stuff from lots of herbs into a single active, and then the herb stopped working, right? So with isolate, you know, the fear is that we're making the same mistake and we're repeating history again. Yeah, I was going to say, taking that a little further, I mean, nothing study-wise, but we've taken our, our, you know, either our energy or our sleep terpene blend, did it in isolate, distillate, crude oil, ratio of, of hemp oil to cannabis oil, and then a cannabis oil. And generally, we saw the same overall effect if it was the focus or the sleep, just with different levels of either pain relief or psychoactivity but absolutely with figuring out what's doing the heavy lifting that's that's been a, a key driver for our, for our products so i'd like to hear that other people are, are actively looking at that has anyone done a comparative study between water soluble with a emulsifying agent versus not you already kind of yeah yeah and that was just with cbd yeah it was just with cbd well we used um uh, full spectrum, but it was mostly CBD extracted in there. Do you, do you think the emulsifying agent bonded to the other on that full spectrum? Um, well, so uh, most of the oils, probably 99% of them end up getting encapsulated uh, into these emulsions. Um, but there's other things uh, that can be present, like terpenes and alkaloids, which actually can be beneficial uh, to your absorption and the effects that you get. And uh, so we're, we're actually starting some research in that area um, this year. Currently, uh, we're studying uh, a whole bunch of different types of products with our uh, IRB. And although we don't have all the, the, the data right now, we have uh, been testing like micro emulsions, nano emulsions, liposomes, micelles, um, isolate, and so far, before getting like all the data, it does seem like we're seeing the encapsulated products that we're that we've been using to be um, more noticeable with the brain scans. And one of the most interesting things that I've noticed about it is um, the brain seems to light up a little bit more versus any of these uh, products not having CBD in it. Um, but also the voltage in neurons seems to be a little bit better regulated compared to, you know, injured brains versus non-injured brains. And uh, I think by the time we're done with our study, we'll have a little bit more information because the brain, uh, your product that you're using, what ends up getting to the brain, uh, it seems like the brain really loves, you know, fat and sugar. And so the actual plasma levels that are measured in the brain and animal studies seem to be higher when you're using um, high, high amounts of lipids. We're using, yeah, um, so we're using a QEEG system, and uh, which stands for quantitative. Um, and so with the studies that we're doing, we're testing for how the neural networks are uh, connecting. So when you utilize this um, EEG system, it's having you do a subset of patterns that deal with uh, memory and cognitive function. And so it kind of really tests your limits. And so when there's brains that have been injured, sometimes those areas will be dark. They won't light up at all. Part of the brain is dead. And uh, once, we, once we notice, the first part of the study is done without any drug or CBD or cannabinoid given, so we get a baseline. And so it's a six-week study, and the dose increases. 
with a with a brain scan, we're noticing that those that have more full spectrum are having more of the increase in voltage, and the actual part of the brain starts to light up again. Um, these the brain scans are done over time, and when uh, testing on memory, it seems like that part seems to be lighting up the most because you have more of the neural network connections. Sometimes you're able to go around and still make a connection versus like the dead part of the brain. So are you selecting for subjects that have either traumatic brain injury or MS or something with brain damage? Yeah, so one of the, qualifi one of the qualifiers for the patients that we select is that they are a retired athlete with known and documented um, concussions. Um, sometimes repetitively or in different areas of the brain. That's CTE? Uh, CTE is generally classified after they um, cut open the brain, so the patient has to be dead, and then before that it's known as uh, traumatic brain injury. Yeah, so bioavailability and bioactivity. So bioavailability is the amount of the availability of something usually in your blood. There's a, an equation for this, and it's the amount of something in your blood via one consumption method, whether it's ingestion, um, inhalants, whatever, divided by the amount that's available when you take it intravenously, okay, which is direct injection into your blood. It's a very concrete measurement. Um, this is in contrast to bioactivity or the essentially quantification of the, the amount of activity of something. This is difficult for, there, there's really no specific equation that defines this. One of the ways to do it is by looking at something called a receptor uh, binding coefficient. So you have CB1 receptors, for example, and THC binds to CB1 receptors. They essentially connect on a molecular level there is a strength to which they interact, okay? This is relative to a CB1 receptor in CBD, where the interaction is much weaker, so it requires more CBD to achieve effects of the same magnitude. Um, bioavailability is obviously just more concrete, and it's easier to talk about because there's a, a, a direct measurement for it. So there are these things called agonism and antagonism, and they're essentially types of interactions between a chemical and a receptor. Um, and they're often opposing, not absolutely, but sometimes they are. Yeah, um, on the, um, so the bioactivity, there's a, it's not concretely known exactly what CBD is binding to. There haven't been a, enough studies to really know exactly where to target and to make more bioavailability to. You know, whether you're targeting the skin, the brain, a uh, particular tissue in the body. And so that is a particular part that is lacking in information. We do know that there is light binding to CB1, CB2, to particular enzymes. Um, and so I think that's, for me, one of the reasons why um, the focus on availability and different ways to make uh, CBD or cannabinoids available to different parts of the body. Um, so I, I, I think before. Just to simplify things down, I think we've really gone into, you know, <laughs> into the weeds a little bit. A simple way of looking at it is bioavailability, how much gets into your blood if you take it. Bioactivity, you can look at the receptors, et cetera, but another way of looking at it is an outcome, right? So let's say you take, 
you know, and, and we just did this in a study, 10 milligrams of I, our high absorption CBD for 30 days. We saw an amazing outcome where people's blood sugar levels dramatically dropped, okay? So they went from high to the normal range. From the literature, when you look, if to get that same result with regular CBD, you'd have to have a significantly higher amount right in there. And even if it does get into the blood, it doesn't act as much, right? So you could effectively get a, take a much larger dose, but you wouldn't get that blood sugar reduction, you know, um, which is healthy. So basically, it's once it's in the blood, how much action does it do? That's the bioactivity, right? What is it, what's the outcome? Will it get your liver healthier? Will it get your kidneys healthier? Will it bring your blood sugar down? Will it make you more relaxed? Um, I think that's kind of maybe a simpler way of, of thinking about it. And, and that's how we're going about trying to understand what the bioactivity of CBD really is. Because for us to start looking at um, how well it binds to things is, is good. And that's really, really important science. But we're really trying to understand what our product does to a person for after a period of time. So we're looking at what the outcomes actually are. Thank you for that insight and stepping back. I think we were, we were getting a bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we get a little sciencey. Right. A little too sciencey. Uh, let's let, let's say that I were a CBD entrepreneur and I infuse CBD into whatever product I'm selling. How do you think I could use this information that I'm getting right now? on bioavailability versus bioactivity, it sounds like so much is not known. It would be hard for me to take this information into, say, product formulation. But maybe, like, how, how, how do you think an entrepreneur could use this information? I mean, I, I, think, I think you hit on something really, really important here. And the science for cannabis, for CBD, for hemp is, I mean, we're, we're not even at the beginning. I feel like we're five years away from the real starting point. You know, because right now what, you know, my colleagues here are doing, what I'm doing, is we're really gathering the basic data to then say, all right, we've got some data, now we can start setting up real studies and to really understand what's going on. Um, and it's one of those things, you know, we're still in the probably preparatory phase um, to see what's going on, but as an entrepreneur, the real difficulty is that even if this information is out there, you can't really use or make any claims about your products, right? That's, that's really outside of the regulatory framework. So it's one of those things you probably want to think about in designing your products. So you have a good, effective product, um, but you also have to be very careful about what you say. No, I was, I was going to say we we kind of took that question and said, okay, how do other industries do that? And one of the fundamental product development techniques is you benchmark everything that's out there. And we picked the measurement of solubility, knowing that if you don't have soluble, a soluble active, you will not have a bioavailable active. So we went through um, specific USP testing for dissolution to measure how much soluble CBD is in every product that's out there. And when I say every product, I don't mean every product, I mean every class of product. So uh, hemp oil, MCT style tinctures, isolate, gummy bears, um, soft gels, nano, uh, water soluble, you know, different kinds of, of lipid encapsulations. And then we understood what was actually there. What we've noticed is that, and I'm curious to see if you guys have seen this as well, is that everything typically comes back to five milligrams of soluble CBD, whether it's 15% um, of a MCT tincture, nine or 10% of a soft gel. Um, we're, that's the number we keep seeing everything come back to. And you know, we, for our company, selfishly, I'm a little jealous of some of the bioavailability data that they have, but we've, we've ha we, we are able to control that solubility. I'm wondering how far that goes to controlling the bioavailability. If we keep everything not forming a crystal, will it stay that way by the time it gets to the blood, since that's CBD's main issue? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna disagree with you a little bit here. And okay. really absorption is, the question is, how does your body naturally absorb anything? Right? I mean, it could be CBD, it could be the salmon you just ate, it could be vitamin C, right? 
And what you really see is that every kind of ingredient has its own barrier to absorption into your blood. Right? With vitamin C, it upsets your stomach and your body rejects it. Uh, with other ingredients like green tea actives or glutathione, your stomach destroys it. With CBD, the rate limiting step, when you really look at it, it's its ability to associate with lipids, right? So in your study, you associate with surfactants, which are forms of lipids effectively, yeah, and we, you, you saw good absorption. We also, so if you, if you combine it with long chain triglycerides, you actually have a, a much better absorption through the intestinal walls. Exactly, right? So. So, so a lot of it is that you need a co-molecule for it to get in there, right? So CBD on its own, even though it's water dispersible is really what we're talking about, um, isn't going to be enough. It needs the triglycerides. It needs the lipids because that's how your body, your small intestines actually absorbs these kind of ingredients, right? So making it smaller and increasing the surface area is one component, right? And, and, that, adding, and that, adding excipients. To adding, help it out. adding the lipids yeah. will we'll bring it up again. And really, I mean, I've been in this field for, you know, roughly 17, 18 years. And what, what we see is that you have to have the right combination of everything to really maximize the absorption, right? And, and I think effectively in, in your study, that's kind of, I think, where you got, yeah. which, which is really good. And in, in my study using a slightly different methodology, we're also able to, to dramatically increase the absorption. Um, what you see is that, you know, people are using certain techniques that are making the oil miscible or basically disperse in the water, and they're getting some of the way there but they're not getting all the way there because they're not working with the body's natural absorption system. They're just working with solubilities. They're just working with solubilities. Yeah. And to, to, to just to bring it back a little bit, what we're talking about, about adding the lipids and the fats, that's basically a copy of breast milk, okay? Babies that don't have digestive systems, the way they absorb is because it's milk, right? You got the vitamins, you got the nutrition wrapped up in these flat, fat globules called milk. And then they're able to absorb it into the through the digestive tract and get it into their blood. So really all that we're talking about is various ways that we're copying nature. Uh, I don't think any of us claim that we've invented this. Um, I certainly don't. But th there's just a variety of ways of doing it. Um, I think this information is important for people in the industry because um, the industry has been moving pretty quickly. And the common theme is that with uh, science and R&D kind of jumping in, it's going to be one of those things that aids companies if you know they market properly and they're prepared. Um, once the, like the FDA makes their their comments on uh, how the rules will be, uh, being involved in you know compliant uh, companies and knowing what's out there before the rules are made and knowing which direction you want to go could be very helpful. Um, since there's multiple drug delivery systems out there, you can, you know, find one that targets your, um, your market, you know, the best, but also be aware of uh, where we're really at with that at the moment. Is that, is that an option? Not investing in quality assurance? Yeah. There are different levels of investment in quality assurance. There's the head of the curve, right. and there's behind the curve, and I, I think there's a wide range of yeah. various factors in this field. Yeah, I mean, I think at the very minimum, you have to hit you know, part 101 and 111 for dietary supplements. I don't think that's, that's a choice. I think because this field is so new, and you still have a lot of companies that are trying hard, but maybe don't have the experience, I think you really have to invest in extra testing and validate what is it that I'm getting? Is it what they're saying it is? I'm going to test for a couple of extra things um, and go beyond that. I think the other thing that the hemp industry, and you know, we're all part of it, um, has done is they've decided that, you know what, some of these regulations, they don't apply to us. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. And for instance, nano products, right? You see a lot of nano water, nano this, nano that. Um, if you go into the dietary supplement side, you don't see nano vitamin C, you don't see nano curcumin, you don't see nano any of that stuff because it's illegal, right? We know today in the food regimen, neither the USDA nor the FDA allow it in to our food. It is disallowed. Well, um, it goes back to a whole bunch of people dying from nano zinc 
uh, years ago, and th it went right through their head into their brain and killed them. And the FDA and Department of Health and USDA said, we need to protect the American citizenry from this. <laughs> and we're not going to allow it. And I think rightfully so. It sounds like this industry is shielded by the, shielded by the inherent non-toxicity of what we're dealing with. Like, if CBD were more toxic and more deaths were happening, I haven't heard of a swath of CBD deaths yet. It, it, luckily, most of the products labeled as nano aren't really nano. I mean, that's yeah. really what we're talking that's, about. Yeah, it's just a new buzzword for it. It's just a buzzword for sprays, like an oral sprays. I, I yeah. had a, a representative with a unnamed CBD nano water tell me that uh, his CBD would not show up on my HPLC because it's not a nano HPLC. <laughs> 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 Is that, is that a new type of equipment that they're coming out with? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes. Okay. I have a question. question. One is how well is your digestive tract working, right? Are you closer to a baby being just a tube, or do you have a well-developed, you know, bacterial flora in your stomach, etc.? Um, the, the second thing is um, your diet. So there's a great paper that uh, talks about uh, people eating salads with full fat, half fat, or non-fat salad dressing, and the people who had the salad with the full fat salad dressing absorbed more vitamins. Not surprisingly, so. It's a variety of different things. Also has to do with your own habits, exercise, smoking, drinking, sleep. It's, it's very, very complicated. So is it summary, healthier person has better biology? Yes. It's, it helps permeation across the intestinal membranes. So, are you, are you talking about uh, over time, like a duration of hours, or over several? So are you talking about like uh, tolerance levels? Okay. Yeah, this, is, this isn't my research. This is you know, research that I read. Um, you know, the, in, the, the lipids to increase the bioavailability and effectively the bioactivity um, is, is something a little bit different from that because generally what we've been looking at you know, is either full spectrum, right? Um, and the other part of that is that you know, our studies right now, you have to understand, we're limited by an institutional review board and what they'll allow us to do. So right now, the longest study, which we just started, is going to be three months, right? And after we do that study, then they'll say, okay, do it for a year, <laughs> right? So it's one of those things where we're in a stepwise, gradual process where we're getting just little bits of data as we can get them. And what you're really hitting on is there's more questions than there are answers. And the more research we do, it opens up the number of questions even more. Yeah, we're still in the infancy at this, in this industry right now. But um, uh, regarding enhancements, we've we found that adding several other natural uh, fat-soluble uh, chemicals, I guess for lack of a better word, 
um, can actually enhance permeation. So it's not just getting CBD and MCT, but there's other things that you can add to work with the body uh, to get it through those intestinal barriers and into your bloodstream. Yeah, um, I, I was just using chemical as a, you know, but they're, they're natural ingredients. Um, yeah, and, and we only use natural ingredients. Like, so in, in my factories, if it's synthetic, it's not allowed in the door. No, 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 they're, they're doctors. Uh, do doctors fundamentally are used to dealing with a lot of synthetic ingredients. That's not something, and you know, something I say, I don't know if I should say it up here, but arsenic's natural, but I'm not going to eat it. And you know, cow pies can be organic, but you shouldn't eat those either. You know, so a lot of people will have this notion that natural and organic, oh, I'm safe. Cyanide's natural. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, right, botulism. Yeah. Um, it's, it's tough to say, uh, cause the research is, is so limiting. Um, I would, I would avoid things that are, uh, like you say, an unnatural synthetic, um, polymers or something that are added. Uh, but as far as, uh, enhancing the bioavailability, it's, it's all tied to the research. So it'd be more about the, the label claims or, or stuff they put on the side, um, and, and than just specific ingredients. And, and polysorbate 80, uh, a study just came out basically showing causes diabetes, causes Crohn's disease a variety of things yeah. and unfortunately there's a lot of products on the market with it's either called tween 80 yeah, or tween, orbit tween 80. or span 80. the other huge problem in our industry is a lot of companies are using it but not putting it on the label which touches on the quality assurance part yeah. of it and and transparency part of it unfortunately those things make really good emulsions and really good clear emulsions so um, a lot of people are finding uh, difficulty uh, to get alternatives but um, there's right. there's hope Yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that's where you talk about professional companies that have been doing this for decades versus, hey, I just started doing this yesterday. So liposomal vitamin C, I've been manufacturing to the mass market for over a decade now. You know, we, we've been manufacturing these kind of products just now with CBD in it for, for a long, long time. CBD is just, you know, the latest ingredient that we're applying this technology to, right? So we've already worked out, for instance, the water that we use in my facility is a thousand times more pure than the water used for injection, right? We, you have to be very, very careful on the equipment you use, the ingredients you source, and your quality control system needs to be uh, pretty robust. Yeah, it's mainly about having a, a well-developed quality control system and figuring out which farmers are doing, uh, you know, what kind of methods. Yeah, very quick. We're actually looking at a completely different version of that. We're working on materials that pull just cannabinoids out of extracts. So everything else, like the pesticides, the heavy metals, go right past as a waste. So instead of using traditional extraction techniques that don't necessarily apply to this, that pull out everything, we selectively extract the cannabinoids. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of genetic components when it comes to metabolizing THC and CBD. Um, one simple example is the CYP2C9 gene. Uh, it codes for an enzyme that metabolizes THC. Uh, there's a lot more genes that code for other enzymes.
Um, so uh, with, with the, the lipid solubility, I think there may have been a, a disconnect. Um, getting it into the plasma allows it to go to the brain. So we find that if you have small droplets of, of these oils, the lipids, and then you make them water dispersible, uh, it increases the surface area for intestinal absorption to get it into your bloodstream. Um, regarding stabilization, a lot of times it's kinetically driven. Uh, so if you can get your particles small enough, uh, they tend to flocculate and coalesce uh, less frequently. So they make, it's, it's, it takes a lot longer for them to find each other uh, and pop and then make a larger bubble. So it, it's, it's basically size limiting. I, uh, no, we aren't. It's very, very bad for you. That's it. There, there should I, be no conflicting information about CBD nano because no safety study has ever been executed. And what we know about other molecules in the nano phase is that number one, they're illegal in our food source, period. So there's really no discussion about, well, should I try or not? Don't do it. There's a reason that the federal government and the state government has said not to do it. No, it, it's, it's uncontrolled. I mean, that's, that's the issue, right? So with liposomes, I mean, they could be nano-sized, but it's in the form where your body recognizes it and can manipulate it and do what it needs to do with it. Nano-ingredients, you know, if they even exist on the market space, frankly, um, they're uncontrolled by your body, and they'll go to places where maybe they don't belong. There's and also... That's the issue. There's, there's a, so as the particles become smaller, um, coating the surface of these, of these droplets, you need a lot more uh, per volume. Right, so you end up using a lot more of these surface active uh, ingredients. And I think that's probably one of the main causes of it being dispersed in, in other areas of the body, just because you have a higher concentration of these things. Right, so, so, so this is the definition of nanotechnology. It's less than 100 nanometers in diameter, okay? And as the size changes, the function changes, okay? With liposomal or micelle technology to a certain degree, you can have a very large liposome, but it'll still absorb as well as a very small liposome, right, to, to a certain degree. So the correlation there, the question that has to be asked is, is the functionality strictly related to the size? And if the answer to that is yes, that means your body can't control it and it is potentially dangerous. The, the functionality doesn't change a little bit. The functionality can change significantly. Right. Exactly. I, I'd like to add on it um, to this uh, topic as well. Um, so in a lot of the studies with nanotech stuff used in pharmaceuticals, uh, safety and toxicity is a big question because if it's not safe that you get, you get these nano or small particles, zero to a hundred nanometers that can collect in the liver or the kidney, or if they don't get in your body, they could get into a water source such as the pool or something like that if it's on the, you know, your skin. And there's a lot of studies that have to be done on that to say if it is safe or if it's not. So 